Hey geeks and geekettes, welcome back to the Madhouse. It's Ask Chuck Dixon number 43. And let's get right to the questions without further ado, or any ado at all. Ben Baker, he wants to know, movie writers who want their name removed from a project use the nom de plume Alan Smithy. Do you know of anything similar for comics? I think actually it's directors that use the Alan Smithy. Um... Screenwriters who don't want their names on things generally make up their own name. But Alan Smithy is a, directed by Alan Smithy, is a um, signal to the cinema world, sort of an inside joke, that the, uh, the director didn't like the finished product of the movie and took his name off it. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, I mean, this happens a lot. I mean, Jack Kirby used to change his name depending on what genre he was working in. My favorite is... When he did westerns in the 40s, uh, he, he called himself Lance Kirby. <laughs> so, um, but the, the, the most recent, I, well, yeah, I, I don't know if it happens today. Who knows, right? Uh, actually, I worked on a project recently that uh, a very talented artist was concerned about um, blowback because there was a bit of politics to it. And so um, he, he used a nom de plume. But uh, the most famous example, or the one I think of when I was a kid, was when uh, Gene Colan uh, drew Submariner for Marvel under the name Adam Austin. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I kind of have a feeling Stan made it up for him. Uh, so for a long time, he, he drew Submariner, uh, the Submariner strip in Tales of Astonish under the name Adam Austin, uh, primarily, I suppose, because he didn't want DC mad at him because at this point the DC Marvel rivalry had really heated up and there was a great degree of animosity uh, from DC toward uh, anybody who went to Marvel. Um, I don't know who Gene thought he was fooling because <laughs> you know, so in addition to being one of comics greatest artists he's also one of comics most idiosyncratic artists. Um, even when I was a kid I knew Adam Austin was Gene Colton. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I was a big fan of the stuff he did um, at Warren Comics, and you know he's got that style. That sort of it's a style all his own. No one else drew comics the way Gene Colan did. Uh, inventive and um, just his own thing. Um, Gene was quite quite the individual. Um, so I don't think he was fooling anybody, but. You know, he could always just deny it. You know, hey, some guy's aping my style. Uh, after a while, he be, he began signing his work at, at uh, Marvel. And he, he had worked at Marvel for quite a while. In fact, hey, you got time for a story? Gene Cullen told me this story his very self. Uh, I was at a convention, I think in Erie, Pennsylvania. And uh, Gene got to talking. And he tells this great story about how he went to deliver a... Um, uh, like a five-page story to Marvel. This was during the pre-superhero monster era. Uh, and he was doing work for Strange Tales and Tales to Astonish and Tales of Suspense. And uh, he was delivering this job. And at the same time, he was doing like Hopalong Cassidy at DC. Um, so he delivers this job to Stan and, and he says, hey, you got anything else for me? And Stan says, no. And he says, Stan's really looks down. You know, he said he was always, Stan was always so upbeat but today, Stan looked depressed. And he said, Gene, I'm having to let everybody go. I can't take on any more artwork. Um, he says, we're going to reduce the number of our titles. And it looks like we might be going out of business. We're, we're having a lot of problem with distribution and the money's not right. And, uh, you know, the people in the magazine end here, at magazine management or whatever they were calling the company that day, uh, they're talking about shutting down the comics. And he goes, I'm keeping Jack, I'm keeping Steve, and I'm keeping Don, and we're going to try something. You know, and if it doesn't work out, we're shuttered. We're done. Marvel Comics is kaput, you know. And uh, Gene's like, wow, you know. So what, what Gene is there for is, you know, this is just before Fantastic Four and Spider-Man are created. <laughs> I mean, that's what, what Stan and Steve and Jack and Don are going to work on. Iron Man, uh, Ant Man, like all those, the, the birth of the Marvel Age of Comics. So Gene's like distraught, you know, you know, 
part of his revenue was gone. He had, he had reliable employment at Marvel doing these, you know, five pagers, you know, and eight pagers. He did war stories, he did Westerns, incredible war stories through the fifties by Gene. So he says he goes down to the street and he doesn't know what he's going to do. He literally only has a dime in his pocket. And, uh, he, he's facing a long walk home. Uh, or he can go to, uh, he can go over to DC and see if they're, they've got any work for him. And um, so he can, he can either use that dime to take the subway back home, or he can use the dime to call DC. So he's down on the street in front of the Marvel offices and finds a phone booth, puts the dime in, Phone takes the dime and the call doesn't go through. <laughs> nothing. No dial tone, no nothing. And Gene is like at his wit's end. Now, not only will he not be able to go to D.C. because you have to call ahead. You couldn't just show up. Uh, not only can, can he not go to D.C., he's going to have to walk home, carry his portfolio home. So he's walking down the street. and Well, yeah, first, first, in the phone booth, he's so distraught. He, had, he literally drops to his knees in the phone booth. And he's praying to God and Jesus and anyone else who will listen to give him his dime back. Let me have my dime back. Just let me have my dime back. And he's banging on the phone. No, they won't give it back. So he says, man, all I wanted was my dime back. So he's walking down the street, head down, God's lonely man, feeling put upon. And there's something shiny just ahead of him on the sidewalk, sticking out of a crack in the sidewalk. And what is it? It's a dime. So Gene takes the dime, pries the dime out of that crack in the sidewalk, runs over to the next phone on the next corner, puts it in, gets through to DC's offices, and he manages to get Bob Kanager on the phone. And he says, look, I'm looking for work. I'm in, I'm in the city. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for work. Can I come over? Have you got anything for me? And uh, Bob says, yeah, come on over. I do have something for you. And it was this issue of Sea Devils. And um, I remember buying this when I was a kid because um, the gimmick on this issue was they were trying out three new art teams <laughs> and the art teams appear in the issues. It's Joe Kubert, it's um, Ross Andrew and Mike Esposito and Gene Colan. And in each instance, they're actually visiting the Sea Devils <laughs> with their drawing board and their pencils. Um, I, think, I think Andrew and Esposito actually parachute in <laughs> so that was the gimmick. This the issue was divided into three stories, uh, three chapters, each one drawn by a different art team, and um, the artists themselves appear in the stories. It was a cool gimmick. I liked it when I was a kid. I really, you know, because I never really thought about, you know, I was beginning to start to think about these things being created, being drawn. So anyway, Gene, Gene got you know continuing work at DC, and later went on to work for Marvel again, and, and just about every other major publisher. But I love that story. I love that story. Uh, he was there. He was an eyewitness to history. So, another Ben Baker question. Are there any movie remakes or sequels that you prefer to the originals? Um, well, there's a French movie called Wages of Fear, which is an excellent movie. I mean, I don't not like Wages of Fear. Uh, it's an excellent movie. It's about a bunch of, uh, you know, reprobates and losers who have to take uh, a shipment of dynamite along a dangerous road in a third world country. And uh, it, it's a, it's a very good movie, but it's made even better when William Friedkin takes it on and makes it into the movie Sorcerer in the early seventies. And Sorcerer just hypes up everything that was in Wages of Fear to 11. And uh, it's a terrific atmospheric film with some brilliant performances and it, it's one of those movies where it looks like the cast really physically suffered to make the film. It has some, if you've never seen it, it's got some absolutely astounding suspense moments. And as I said, it's a William Friedkin uh, movie. And uh, it's got Roy Scheider and uh, uh, pretty much an international cast. But it's, it's just good stuff, good stuff. Another one, and you know, probably everyone agrees on this, I, I, I love The Thing from Another World, the Howard Hawks science fiction film from the 50s. It's flawless to my mind. It is just seamless entertainment. Uh, absolutely fell in love with this movie when I was a kid, and uh, that love has not abated over the years. 
It is excellent stuff. I was lucky enough in the 70s to see it in a, a theater with a whole audience, with a packed audience. And it was every bit as effective, you know, 20 years later as it probably was when it was originally released. Um, but there's the John Carpenter version, which is awesome as well. It's, it's a different kind of movie. It hews closer to John W. Campbell's original short story, Who Goes There? But, um, you know, I, I like both of them. I like both of them. They're both great movies. And uh, I, I watch them on quite often on, on a rotation. Another French film, uh, Bob Le Flambeur, or Bob the Gambler, is a terrific French, you know, heist, gambling, you know, crime, low-life kind of picture, the kind of movie that the French excel in making. Uh, you know, the, the French fell in love with American cinema and with American gangster pictures um, in particular and really did a lot to contribute to the, the genre. Uh, you, you simply can't do better than a French police thriller or a French heist movie. Uh, but Bob La Flambeur was remade by Neil Jordan uh, as The Good Thief. And this is one of my favorite movies of all time. And Nick Nolte uh, takes the lead. Uh, he's an expatriate American and heroin addict uh, living in Paris. And um, it's got a terrific heist element to it, but it's a great character study as well. And uh, some beautiful cinematography, uh, great use of music, and a, a dry, dry, dry sense of humor that I really like. Uh, I, I like Neil Jordan movies um, <clears throat> because no matter where they're set or who's in them, they're they're ultimately Irish stories. <laughs> Dry sense of humor and a wee bit sad. Uh, <laughs> uh, terrific, terrific movie. Jack Nero ninety nine says you said repeatedly you don't follow characters that you once wrote. But in a recent book, Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon got married, or somehow not. It's kind of confusing. Uh, did not know that. In many people's eyes, and also mine, your runs on both these characters are the best they ever had, including their very, very good year one stories. Thank you to Scott Beatty as well. Uh, as someone who, like you said, wanted to write a romance comic, what was the way you had in mind for these two if you wouldn't have left the book so early? And what are your general thoughts on so long-lasting, will-they-won't-they they, cliche romances? Well, the thing about cliches sometimes is they're cliches and they're tropes and they're common themes because people like them. <laughs> the love them and hate them kind of thing uh, works. You know, to my mind, you know, I wasn't, I probably, if I'd stayed on the books forever, which was never going to happen, I probably would not have had these characters um get married or, or enter into anything like a real serious relationship. But there's a word propinquity. And if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's when two people who have been around each other a lot suddenly develop an attraction. And I thought, why wouldn't these two be attracted to each other? Who in the world could they relate to better than each other? Uh, both were, you know, basically Batman spinoffs. You know, Batgirl was never quite a sidekick, but she sort of was too. And it just seemed natural to me that these two would, you know, have something beyond a friendship. You know, they're approximately the same age. Barbara's a little older than Dick. And uh, I don't know, it, just, it just seemed like a natural fit all the way around. And once I started writing it, 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 it was too much fun to leave alone. Um, and I never did, you know, other than, than Birds of Prey number eight, uh, which is like a date night comic, uh, I, I never really was explicit about their relationship at all. So, uh, it was sort of a background thing. It was sort of an understanding that the two of these were romantically involved and, um, you know, obviously dedicated to each other and obviously good friends. Uh, when we did the Batgirl year one mini, um, we, we basically addressed the idea that, that Dick Grayson was the first one to make an approach, you know, uh, the hormones were rising, you know, the, the, the teen wonder couldn't keep his hands off her. And it's one of my favorite sequences in comics. I can't remember who wrote it. I can't remember who it was me or Scott 
wrote the sequence of their first kiss. But um, I thought it was, uh, as my mother would say, cute. So, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't have continued it forever. I probably would have had a little bit of a stormy breakup. But they were both, they're both adults. They're both heroes. They both have high principles. And they would have parted as friends eventually. And this is all supposition. I have no idea what I would have done beyond this point. Now, um, I'm going to continue talking about authors that I like, uh, even though no one specifically asked that. Uh, I got a question a while back, who are some of your favorite authors? And Donald E. Westlake has got to be at the top of the list. Donald E. Westlake is considered by most writers, of uh, most genre writers, to be a writer's writer. And he wrote in a lot of different genres, but mostly crime. And as Donald E. Westlake, he wrote mostly caper comedy novels. Um... You're probably most familiar with the film version of The Hot Rock. And The Hot Rock was, uh, featured the Dortmunder Gang. And the Dortmunder Gang, I can't remember how many novels Westlake wrote with these guys. Uh, the Dortmunder Gang is a bunch of guys out of New York. They always get involved in an interesting, dangerous heist, sometimes reluctantly. Uh, these are very funny novels. The novels are hysterical. They're character-driven. Um, they're sharp, and the, and the heists are always brilliantly done. Um, Dortmunder is, you know, the king of the deconstructed plotline. The plotline where everything that could go wrong does go wrong, but Dortmunder somehow, you know, comes out in the end exhausted but victorious. And uh, he created this series when he was writing another series, which um, he wrote under the name... Richard Stark. He wrote about Parker, who was a, a thief. And these are very serious, very grim, hard-boiled crime stories involving heists. And they're not like um, super complicated heists. They're usual payroll holdups, armored car, you know, strong arm stuff. And in each of these novels, uh, are, which are also deconstructed plot lines, uh, Parker is generally... Um, you know, ripped off by his partners, or there's some unforeseen circumstance happens, or he makes some enemies based on what he stole. And the uh, the Dortmunder books were um, created when um, Westlake was writing a Parker novel in which Parker was going after this gem. And all of these different things happened that he kept losing this very, very valuable gem, the Hot Rock. He kept losing it and having to once again steal it. So he had to keep stealing the same rock over and over and over again. And about halfway through the novel, Wesley thought, you know, this is coming off as kind of contrived, and he put it aside. And then he thought about it more, and he thought, you know, this would play better as a comedy. And so he created the Dortmunder Gang and, and rewrote it as a comedy. Um, you know, the um, what, what one character in the book calls the perpetual crime is... is what he, what he came up with rather than a perfect crime. So anyway, he wrote these Parker novels, which were turned into, uh, you know, movies. And, well, for you comic fans, uh, Darwin Cook's excellent adaptation, adaptations of the first few Parker novels. But, uh, you know, these are instant comic book classics. Um, but, you know, famously, Lee Marvin played him in, in uh, the movie Point Blank. And... Mel Gibson uh, did a very good job as Parker in Payback, which is um, Point Blank and Payback basically adapt the same novel. It's the first Parker novel called The Hunter. And, um, you know, but they're very different movies. And he's been played by, he's been played by Jim Brown. He's been played by Robert Duvall. <laughs> he's played by uh, Jason Statham in a recent film. So, um, you know, Parker, uh, Peter Coyote played in that movie called Slagra, a terrible movie called Slay Ground. Good novel, terrible movie. Anyway, my favorite um, Westlake novel of all is not a Dortmunder novel or a Parker novel. It's a novel called Kahala. And um, this is, I've, I've, I've lost track of how many times I've reread this novel. And I've listened to the audio book. I just, I just love this book. Um, it's a heist story, but unlike any other. Uh, it takes place during the, uh, in the 80s, there was a coffee shortage throughout the world. 
And uh, if you were a coffee drinker, sometimes you had to pay dearly. If you could find coffee, there was actually no coffee. Uh, I, I can't remember what if it was a blight, something, a blight down in South America, or something happened, and coffee prices went through the roof. Um, and so <laughs> this heist novel is about a bunch of mercenaries who decide to steal a coffee train in Africa. And the coffee train they're going to steal belongs to Idi Amin. <laughs> Idi Amin Dada, the iron-fisted, sadistic dictator of Uganda. So the stakes couldn't be higher. First of all, they're going to steal a train. It's, that's fascinating how Westlake lays it out. It's, it's, um, it's uh, all done very believably. I mean, he, he, he lays the logistics out. They're going to steal an entire train load of coffee. And the stakes are high in any kind of heist. And this is a heist in Africa. You know, you're not, you're not going to get a slap on the wrist if you get caught. And it's not only Africa, it's Uganda under Idi Amin. So you're going to, you know, you're going to be taking a baseball bat to the head, my friend, <laughs> you know, after stealing Idi Amin's coffee beans. So uh, it's, it's just a hell of a novel. And it's his most bluntly written novel, even more blunt and stark than the Parker novels. Um, there's there's um, some rare Donald Westlake sex scenes in it, and they are the most bluntly written sex scene you will ever read. They're not even in the least bit titillating because of the way they're written. Um, but yeah, this is brilliant. If you ever get a chance to check this one out, please do. God only knows why they didn't make this into a movie. It's not too late, folks. All right, James Mealy. So what are your three favorite Alfred Hitchcock movies? Mine are Psycho, Vertigo, and Rope just so you know, and why. I don't know why those are your favorite ones. Oh, you want to know why my, mine are my favorite? Well, my absolute favorite is Rear Window. Uh, I watch this maybe once, sometimes twice a year. Perfectly constructed film, if you don't know the plot line. It's from a Cornell Woolrich story. Um, Jimmy Stewart breaks his leg. He's a professional photographer. He's, he's convalescing in his garden apartment. Uh, with his only view, there's no TV in the room, his, his only view of the world is out his window into the courtyard, the rear courtyard of the apartment building. And he gets to know all of his neighbors, all their foibles, and basically he's following the stories of his neighbors like you would a soap opera. Uh, and this keeps him occupied. Uh, but the soap opera turns deadly when uh, neighbor Raymond Burr maybe killed his wife. And the suspense begins there as Jimmy Stewart wonders, did I see things? Am I imagining things? Or did he really kill his wife? And the clues mount up and the evidence mounts up. And there's a lot of reversals in the story. Uh, but it's brilliant because it's all told from Jimmy Stewart's point of view. He never leaves that room. The story never leaves that room. And it's absolutely, it's a, it's a marvel of technical filmmaking. It's a marvel of set direction. It's a moral, you know, they must have storyboarded this thing up the wazoo to make it work. And it does. It does. It, it, it delivers. And this is another one I was lucky enough to see with a theater audience. Uh, in the 80s, Universal re-released all of the Hitchcock films that he made at Universal to theaters. So I got to see this one. And once again, packed house and worked every bit as well. People were screaming and jumping in their seats just as they probably did when it was first shown. My other favorite Hitchcock is, is a lesser known one. It's called Shadow of a Doubt. And it stars Teresa Wright, who's a teenage actress, and Joseph Cotton as her uncle. Um, and um, one of the things I like about it is it deals with a very serious subject matter without ever directly dealing with it. And that is um, basically child molestation. Uh, it's very clear that Joseph Cotton's interest in his niece is not healthy. But of course, this is 1940s film, so it's never directly, you know, directly addressed. But uh, you know, adults in the audience knew what the hell was going on in this in this story, and it makes it super super creepy. Now it's it's got a, you know, murder subplot, and it's much like Rear Window in that she suspects her uncle of being a murderer, but can't prove it and wants to prove it, and she gives a terrific performance. Joseph Cotton is super creepy without ever going psycho, without ever really. It's a very nuanced performance. Uh, he's he's dangerous and imposing and everything else, but he never works hard at it. It's it's a it's a really sublime portrait of a sociopath. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of subtlety, a lot of nuance in this film. 
Now, on the surface, it works as a perfectly good thriller, kind of Nancy Drew kind of thing. Uh, but but the underlying, you know, elements of it is what lift it above the norm. The other thing I love about this movie is its attention to the setting. It's set in a small town America, and uh, there's a continuity, and it had to be conscious on Hitchcock's part. There's a continuity to it that allows you to know where they are in their environment at all times. We basically we tour this small town, and we get to know it as well as its fictitious inhabitants get to know it. So um, you can, you know, you know when they're in front of the drugstore, they're going to pass the five and dime next. I mean, and there's lots and lots of detail. Hitchcock loved this kind of local detail. He loved this kind of Americana, and he throws tons of it into this movie to make the, the, the little town they live in as much a character as everything else in the film. Now, another favorite, Strangers on a Train. Uh, this has got the durable plot line, you know, um, you know, crazy lunatic Robert Walker uh, wants his his uh, father dead. And uh, he suspects that tennis champ Farley Granger wants his ex-wife dead. He's read in the papers that uh, the ex-wife's given us some problems. Now, they meet, you know, quite by chance on a train and get to talking, as sometimes people do. You know, they get to talking in the dining car or the smoking car. I can't remember which. But, you know, people talk a little bit more on trains than they do on airplanes. And, uh, you know, so this was something the audiences would have certainly understood. You, you know, you meet people on a train, you're never going to meet again. So Robert Walker gets in his head that they've got a deal. They're, he calls it the crisscross. You, you murder my father, and I murder your ex, and there's no line back to either of us. You know, neither of us have a motive. They'll never come looking for us, and each of us will have an alibi. And everything else. Well, of course, Robert Walker goes through with his end of the deal and kills the ex in an absolutely unforgettable sequence. Um, and um, but of course, Farley Granger thought it was just a joke, and he doesn't want to go with through with his. But of course, Bruno, as played by Robert Walker, wants to pressure him into it. And then there, the suspense lies. Uh, he's going to make Farley Granger's life hell until Farley Granger. Um, comes through on his end of the bargain. It's from a story by uh, Patricia Highsmith. And uh, if you've never read Patricia Highsmith, um, boy, she could write about crazy people, um, cold-blooded killers like nobody's business. And she always came up with these brilliant plot lines, much like uh, Strangers on a Train. And this uh, Hitchcock uh, enjoyed her writing and, you know, does a very good job of translating uh, High Smith's kind of suspense story to the screen. Uh, of course, giving it the Hitchcock touch, but uh, it's still very much Patricia Highsmith's story. Um, I urge you, if you've never read any of her Ripley novels, to read them. Uh, they've also been made into films all over the world. Uh, but um, yeah, those are my three favorite Hitchcocks, and those are why, I, and that's why I like them. There you go. Can't make it clearer than that. Okay, Jack. I'm wondering if you've ever watched or played any of the famous video games Red Dead Redemption. There are spins on classic spaghetti westerns and the genre as a whole. If you haven't, what's your opinion on video game storytelling? Um, yeah, I played uh, the first version years ago. I don't play video games anymore. Well, I play them on the computer, I, but I don't play them on the computer anymore. I haven't in you know, more than 10 years. But I did play this one. It was fun, and it was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, but I wasn't engaged enough to keep playing it or playing any of its sequels. Uh, but, you know, I, like I said, it was fun, you know, riding a horse and shooting and hiding behind barrels while other guys shot at you. <laughs> Reminded me of, you know, playing in the back alley when I was a kid with my, uh, my, my cap gun. But, uh, yeah, I mean, video game storytelling, I, I really don't play enough. I can't say what the state of video games are like now because I haven't played them in so long. I never really got that much into them, so I can't talk a lot about it. I do know from the working end, when I've been asked to write for video games, uh, I, you know, I don't know if I was working for people that weren't very talented or imaginative, but generally they were, um, let's say, compromised in the area of story structure. And um, one company I worked for, I swear, they wanted the game to be dull. <laughs> Any, anything interesting that myself or the other writers came up with, they just shot down immediately. 
uh, without saying, you know, maybe this is a little too interesting. <laughs> I mean, the games were tedious too, so I don't know. So yeah, I can't speak to a hey, long answer that I don't know. <laughs> what do you want from me? Okay, Drew North. How did it feel writing for such a traditional left winger like Green Arrow? I'm sure there were challenges keeping with the legacy of that character. Um, yeah, somewhat. I mean, I didn't, you know, I'm famously conservative, but I didn't want to use the character to mock liberalism. Uh, but the thing is, you got to also, you know, um, Ali, Ali's not only uh, a liberal, he's also, or liberal minded. Um, he's also impulsive and a womanizer. So uh, it wasn't hard to get him into trouble uh, if there was a pretty woman around and she was um, down with a cause that, that he thought that he agreed with. <laughs> uh, which, you know, ultimately got him in trouble in my run and he died because of it. He got hooked up with a woman that he thought was out to save the whales and it turned out she was an eco-terrorist lunatic, you know, out to kill the human race. Um, so, you know, he paid, you know, in the end for not really examining his ideology to the degree he should have, you know, basically not thinking about the unintended consequences of his actions, but that, you know, that was Ali. So I just wrote him as an extension of that. Of course he was just a standard, you know, um, you know, guy vigilante, you know, Batman with a bow and arrow until, um. Denny O'Neill and, and Neil Adams turned um, him into a crusader, a a left wing, you know, bleeding heart crusader in the famous um, Green Arrow, Green, Green Lantern run. And um, you know, I've spoken on that on this run before. You know, I, I thought it was you know well done, but I didn't agree with any of it, <laughs> and and apparently readers didn't either because it, it didn't sell. It's famous amongst fans because it's kind of an anomaly. Uh, it was an attempt by DC Comics to become more relevant. Uh, I guess they saw this as maybe their inroad to be hipper, which is something they were always pursuing um, because, you know, they were up against Marvel. And Marvel was always perceived as hipper. And I think DC let Denny and Neil do this because they thought, well, maybe this will make us seem as cool as Marvel. But it didn't work. Uh, and, you know, sales were terrible on this book. But um, for my point, you know, a character is a character. I mean, I'll write the character as they are. I mean, I think I presented Ali fairly uh, and his beliefs fairly. I certainly showed him as passionate. Um, but, you know, after Mike Grell's run, he was a little bit more cynical because, you know, Mike Grell's run, you know, Ali is... is is run through the ringer emotionally and the rest of it. He comes out the other side a little bit broken. And I, I, I address that as well. Uh, but he's, he's always looking for an injustice to fight like, like, like any superhero. Right. But um, his kind of fell in line with his isms, you know, his, his beliefs. Um, so, yeah, but you know, he, I wrote the character as he was, I, I didn't mock him, make fun of him, uh, make him look like a fool. Uh, Ollie does that all his own because he's constantly chasing women. Um, obviously a sex addict. So, you know, it's, it's just like when I wrote uh, anti-gun screeds for, for Batman. You know, I wrote them and they were logical and impassioned and I didn't believe anything Batman was saying, but, you know, that's not my job. My job isn't to put my words in Batman's mouth. My job is to put Batman's words in Batman's mouth. So, um, so there you go. There you go. And I had a lot of fun twitting Denny and having fun with Denny behind the scenes because I was writing, you know, one of his signature characters. And he took it all in good sport because he was a mensch. Okay, Dr. Carstairs. Hey, Doc. Okay, so there are any manga you would like to write? Classic, contemporary, ongoing, anything. I personally would love to see your take on Lone Wolf and Cub. I wouldn't go anywhere near Lone Wolf and Cub. I love Lone Wolf and Cub the way it is. And I'm not as imbued with Japanese culture that I would know how to write it or approach it in an inventive way, if you know what I mean. I'm not conversive enough, conversant enough, and I probably never will be, to, to take on as classic a samurai character as Lone Wolf and Cub and, and do it justice. You know, I would be a tourist. I would write a pastiche. You know, I would write something that Japanese audiences would laugh at, <laughs> unintentionally. 
But a character that is kind of in my wheelhouse that I really like and I've followed for years is uh, Google, Google 13, um, Duke Togo. He's a hired killer, a badass. You know, he'll kill anybody that you, you want as long as you meet his price. And um, gets involved with, you know, heist stories and revenge stories and espionage and all kinds of stuff. So he's kind of Punisher, Punisher-like and uh, lots of gunplay and car chases and stuff like that. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's really in my wheelhouse. And I have, I've read these comics, you know, I've read the, um, you know, English language editions. They're, they didn't do enough of them for my money. But I would also, you know, since the 70s, I've been picking up the manga in Japanese. Because, um, you know, manga, it's, even if you don't understand the language, you can follow along the action set pieces and things like that. Uh, and the stories are so well told that they were, um, um, you know, easy enough to follow. You know, I got the gist of the story. And uh, so, yeah, if, if I was tasked with writing any manga, so you can write any manga you want, Goggle 13 would, would be a good fit for me, I believe. Uh, I'm not saying I would do a better job than the original creators because these stories are intense. Uh, they're intricately woven. They're beautifully presented. But, uh, you know, if I had to, this is the one I would pick. Hey, if you like this video, why not share it with a friend? You probably know some comics fan, some geek, some uber nerd who would love to hear stories like the one I told about Gene Colan. You know, some inside baseball, some behind the scenes comic book stuff. Uh, you know, you're in it. You're listening. You know, you're, you're learning more and more about, um, you know, the mind of a comic book writer. Maybe you have a friend uh, who would like to do the same. Or maybe you belong to a group. You know, share it on Facebook. You know, just let others know so I can grow this audience and keep doing these. Because I do enjoy doing them, but uh, they do take time out of my schedule. So I got to make it worthwhile. And the only thing that really makes it more worthwhile than it is now is if the audience for these grows. Uh, I'm approaching 2,000 subscribers. If I could get to, you know, 5,000 subscribers, that would definitely make these worth doing. And the only way to do that is to share. Because the Internet, in case you haven't noticed, is an enormous place. And it's very, very easy to get lost in the shuffle. And, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there who would like to watch some of these videos who have simply not ever heard of them. So why don't you help me out? I appreciate it. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And I will see everybody down the road.